Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we're going to be talking with Dr. Jack Hughes. He's an astrophysicist at Rutgers University, and he'll be telling us about new findings concerning supernovae, the powerful eruptions that can mark the end of life for massive stars. But first, we're going to use computer simulations to appear inside the atmosphere of Saturn. And we're going to look in on an unusual yellow supernova and find out what made this eruption so darn strange. And we're going to look to the future as researchers plan a massive radio telescope on the far side of the moon. The magnetic field of Saturn is surprisingly symmetrical near the poles, a mystery of the ringed planet that might now be explained. Researchers from Johns Hopkins University took data collected during the suicide plunge of the Cassini spacecraft into Saturn. And then they fed it that into computer simulations similar to those used to model weather and climate here on Earth. They found that the helium rain falling through the atmosphere of Saturn could explain the oddly regular nature of this massive magnetic field. Join us starting on June 1st when we're going to talk with Professor Sabine Stanley of Johns Hopkins University about this unique study. An unusual supernova which took place 35 million light years from Earth called 2019 YVR exploded without the layer of hydrogen typically seen covering massive stars prior to similar eruptions. This, is, <clears throat> this unusual yellow supernova was first seen following the eruption and researchers then traced its location back to a star seen by the Hubble Space Telescope more than two years before. Researchers believe a small, unseen companion star may just have stripped its larger companion of its outer shell of hydrogen, resulting in this unusual supernova eruption. For hundreds of millions of years after matter first formed in the cosmos, hydrogen and helium gas floated free before collapsing into stars and releasing light. This era, uh, known as the Cosmic Dark Ages, is little understood by astronomers as light from this age of the universe is now in the form of extremely low frequency radio waves which are blocked by the atmosphere of Earth. A proposed lunar crater radio telescope placed on the far side of the moon could study this radiation free of the Earth's atmospheric effects as well as interference from human-made radio signals. This revolutionary instrument, which would be constructed by robots on the far side of the moon, Hello, nerd. is currently being seriously considered by NASA for further development. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. 
for information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we're going to talk with Dr. Jack Hughes, astrophysicist at Rutgers University, about the mysterious missing supernova that formed the nebula Cassiopeia A. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to talk with Dr. Jack Hughes. He is an astrophysicist at Rutgers University, and he's done some interesting recent work uh, uncovering the nature of supernovas. Welcome to the show, Jack. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Okay, so just for people who may not be familiar, um, if you put your astronomer cap on for a moment and tell us what is a supernova and how do they usually occur? Well, uh, the supernova is the death of a star. And um, they come in two main categories, uh, two main classes. One of them is the explosion of a massive star. And that's what our uh, paper was about. And uh, the other type are um, explosions of white dwarfs. White dwarfs are very compact stars that are the end point of evolution of a star like our own. And uh, the white dwarf supernovae are very important because those are the ones that are used in cosmology to determine or to measure and to discover that the universe was accelerating. And some of your listeners may have uh, may know about that discovery. But in this particular study, we looked just at the remnant of an exploded massive star in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. And so the object, the main object you're looking at, as I understand, is Cassiopeia A. Cassiopeia A, which behind That's it. it. <laughs> so uh, one of the things I found interesting is that with a lot of supernovae, we have records of, uh, of them being seen on Earth. The Crab Nebula explosion was seen in 1054, for instance, but we didn't see this one. There's no clear records saying, hey, there's a new star up here that appeared on this and that date. So what was different about this supernova? Well, in fact, that's a big mystery about Cassiopeia A. We, um, we uh, you know, there were some really um, great astronomers back in the day when we think Cassiopeia exploded, um, but they never recorded it. It was supposedly sometime in the 16, the mid 1600s where the explosion occurred about 350 years ago. And um, um, we, we, we really don't understand. It, it could be uh, that Weather was bad in Europe and other places where the astronomers would have been observing. Uh, it could also be that the supernova was an unusual type that was not particularly bright when it exploded. Uh, but by and large, I don't think there's a solution to that question. Uh, I think it's, it remains a mystery why we never detect, we never saw Cassay when it exploded. Hmm. So what do you think, um, so you went into some details in your study about um, what occurred within this supernova that may have been different than a typical uh, supernova. Can you talk a little bit about what made this one so special? Okay, well, um, what may be different about the supernova uh, that made it difficult to see would have been um, its, the state of its, uh, of the way it was at, at the time it exploded. Uh, it could be that the uh, star wasn't as extended as other massive stars. Um, and so the thing we do know about these massive star supernovae is that they, they vary quite a bit from one to the other. Mm -hmm. They vary in the terms of how much mass there is in the star, and they vary in, in their properties at their very latest stages of evolution. And so the supernova 1987A, uh, which is the most recent supernova that we've uh, that's been in our local area. It's, it was in a neighboring galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud. That one, we actually identified the, the star that blew up. That was a tremendous ability, a uh, tremendous find. 
And we found it was an unusual star. It was a blue supergiant, which was unexpected. So that was a, that caused a real uh, revolution in some ways in understanding these massive star supernovae from the perspective of the type of stars that blow up. So we obviously don't know, we, there was no measurement of the star that blew up um, to form the Cass A supernova, Cassiopeia A supernova on it. Um, so we really can't do that. So we're, basically what we're doing is we're inferring everything that we can about the properties of the explosion from uh, the remnant that we see now, the remains of the star that blew up and expanded out into the interstellar medium. And that's the image you've shown, you, you show behind you. That's X-ray emission from hot gas from the star that blew up, propagating out at high speed through the galaxy. And it's about, uh, it's about 10 light years in size now, which is a um, pretty fast expansion rate for only about 350 years. Okay. So, uh, so that, uh, that, that the, uh, so, but what we think, we think that the, the mechanism, the supernova engine, we call it, it's that, it's that engine that causes the star to explode. We are pretty confident that that is a consistent engine across massive star, so, uh, massive star supernova. And that's what we were able to probe with our new study, the parts of that engine. Hmm. And, uh, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the details on this is that um, particles called neutrinos may have played a significant role in this supernova explosion and uh, assumedly others. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, I mean, what is a neutrino and what's its role in, in supernova eruptions? Well, the, the neutrino was, uh, was um, the name was given by Fermi in Italian, and, he, and it's called the little neutral one. And another famous uh, physicist, it might have been I.I. Rabi, who said, who ordered that? It was discovered uh, as a, um, it was, a, Fermi actually discovered it by uh, studying the decays of, of certain isotopes, um, radioactive decays, and he found that there was missing energy. And so, the idea was that there's a, an unknown neutral particle that's carrying away the energy. And um, ultimately that particle was discovered and, and that discovery led to the Nobel Prize. Um, and we now know that neutrinos come in three flavors. There's one that's associated with the electron and then there's one associated with the muon, which is kind of a heavy electron. And then the um, third one is uh, the tau, it's a tau neutrino. Um, but for the purposes of this discussion, we don't really need to know explicitly what type of neutrino it is. Uh, they all have basically very similar behavior. They're very, very, um, they're very uh, weak. They're very uh, light. They're the, the least massive subatom subatomic particle. We don't exactly know their mass, but we do know uh, sort of ratios of their masses. And we know that it's quite small. Uh, the other thing that we know about neutrinos is that they are very weakly interacting. They don't interact with matter much at all, whereas photons and electrons and protons and neutrons, sort of normal matter, they interact um, far, far more intently with matter. So the, um, the idea is that a neutrino can pass through a light year of lead and, and really not be stopped. So they're very, very weakly interacting. Um, and it takes really extreme efforts to, on Earth, to try to detect them. And you used the uh, data, about eight years of data from the Chandra X-ray telescope. Tell us um, what, I mean, what were the advantages, what were you able to get from Chandra? And why did you choose that telescope to look at? Okay, well, um, the, uh, I already talked about how rapidly the ejected material from the supernova is moving. It's moving so rapidly that when it heats up the matter, it heats it up to X-ray emitting temperatures. And so Chandra as an X-ray telescope really gave us um, incredibly new insights into the explosion. And in fact, the very, uh, one of the earliest observations that Chandra made was of Cas A and it was, um, a remarkable discovery. Previously to then, um, we had sort of like poor vision in the x-rays. And with Chandra, it was like we put our glasses on and we could just see all of this amazing structure. And so 
that very that observation led to the first publication of Chandra data, and it led to basically the idea um, that that we've been pursuing since of the of the sense that the neutrinos in the explosion um, are able to give some energy, give some extra oomph to the explosion that it seems the theorists tell us we need. And that oomph causes um, heating that's unstable. And it the evidence, and, and so the theorists sort of have been leading us to the idea that these explosions have neutrinos as a key ingredient, that neutrinos themselves are, they're not the most stable heating mechanism. And so the heating that they produce causes a lot of convection in the material. And that convection allows the innermost material to actually be flung out beyond stuff that's originally further out. So it's kind of like in your, in your room, you know, when it's in the winter time and you have a radiator, um, the air around the radiator gets hot. But, you know, you notice the room is all sort of a comfor comfortable temperature. Uh, but that's because convection takes the hot air from the radiator and causes it to rise up. And that rising up of the hot air causes the cooler air to flow in toward the radiator. So there's a very general um, and, and slow, it's hard, to, it's hard to actually detect it, but there's a convective process that happens even in your room, in your house, uh, as you get heating from a, a radiator uh, that then causes the air to flow. And the basic principle is hot air rises, cold air falls. And so that convection process is uh, essentially what's happening in the core of the supernova. It's part of that supernova engine. And so getting back to the first Chandra observation, what we saw from Chandra was uh, in a specific location of the remnant in the uh, bottom left side, we would call that the Southeast because we, we, we do map the sky and we use North, South, East, West, but the bottom left, there were fingers of iron rich material which were protruding out beyond all the other ejected mass. And we know iron gets produced deep in the core of the supernova, closest to the, uh, the center of the engine. And so it was really, um, it was really a surprise. And so uh, we put forward this idea based on this evidence that we were seeing signs of that supernova engine, the neutrino heating mechanism, uh, flinging this iron rich material out to the edge of the remnant that we see, and, and that's what, what we see now. It's fascinating. And they, so this convection, could this convection process have carried away much of the energy produced in the supernova? Possibly explain why we may not have seen it from Earth, mm -hmm. or is that, is that going too far? No, no, that's, that's, that's going too far. So, so the, <laughs> the so, so the, um, most of the energy of the supernova comes out as neutrinos. Almost all of the energy is neutrinos. About 1% of the energy goes into the ejected material that's flung out at high speed. So most of the energy is released as neutrinos. And so that actually is a reason why the mechanism can work because the vast number of neutrinos means the likelihood that there'll be a very rare interaction with matter is enhanced. And the other thing is, is when the, uh, when the, when the star is exploding, uh, the densities are so high near the center that the ability for there to be interaction is enhanced as well. So what we need in the engine is roughly 1% of the energy of the neutrinos to be transferred to the, uh, to the, uh, the, the stellar matter to produce the explosion. Now, let me tell you one more thing about the neutrinos. And I did mention Supernova 1987A. Uh, it was a watershed for basically another reason, which was that at that point, there were neutrino detectors on Earth that were part of a proton decay experiment of the physicists. And um, they were coming to the end of the usefulness of that study. Uh, and lo and behold, in that early February of 1987, they detected neutrinos from the Large Magellanic Cloud, from Supernova 87A. And in fact, one of them the, in Japan, uh, Kamio Kanda, it detected 11 neutrinos. Now, 
that's a pretty tiny number. But uh, it's basically, when you think of all the energy that came out of that supernova, which was seen naked eye, 1987A was discovered as a naked eye supernova, and it produced 11 detectable neutrinos, we detected 11 neutrinos on Earth, um, even though most of the energy comes out of those, those neutrinos. And those 11 neutrinos are consistent with most of the energy of the supernova. So... Uh, so what's kind of interesting, and this is a little bit off topic, but it's rel related to the neutrinos, is we have had continuous coverage uh, of neutrino telescopes uh, since then. So if there were a core collapse supernova that went off in our own galaxy, we would have seen it in neutrinos. Even if it was buried deep in our galaxy and we couldn't see the optical light, we would detect the neutrinos. So those of us who are getting old in, in, in years, uh, and would love to have a galactic supernova, uh, are continuing to hope that we will detect them in some way, maybe with the neutrinos, but hopefully with uh, the ability to follow up with all of our modern techniques with uh, Chandra and uh, ground-based telescopes and what have you. Hmm. Thank you. And um, so is this, what can this study, uh, what can your study teach us about other, other supernovae? and the process that forms them. Right, so, so this material that we had originally found that was iron rich on the outside of the supernova, um, it was not uh, conclusive. It was, um, it was an exciting finding, but it was not conclusive. Uh, so people have been studying Cassay since, and uh, another group looked at that material with Chandra, and they were able to measure uh, and they were able to actually identify uh, individual little blobs of material, hot X-ray emitting material, uh, that looked to be fully dominated by iron. The uh, you know the iron elements that are very common on Earth, they're also produced very um, in in great abundance in supernovae. Um, so uh, particularly, they're they're produced in the most abundance by the uh, white dwarf supernovae, but the core collapse supernova is like this one, like Cass A, uh, that iron is produced very close to the middle of the engine, right? Where, uh, where the temperatures are hottest, the densities are highest. Sense. Uh, and so they were able to prove that material there was very iron rich and suggested that it came from a certain type of process of nucleosynthesis. And nucleosynthesis is the process by which the elements are built up. And there are a number of different processes there's the processes that happen normally in stars, so-called hydrogen burning, or hydrogen fuses to form helium. That's, a, that's a, a nuclear process, a nucleosynthesis process. But in these exploded supernova run, exploded supernovae, the nucleosynthesis process is a very, um, it's, it's called explosive nucleosynthesis. It's, uh, there's a lot of energy, there's neutrinos, there's a lot of free particles, um, there's a lot of, uh, um, iron and um, the temperatures and densities are very high that um, the, um, there's a, um, a broad range of um, elements that can be produced. But in the hottest and densest parts of the star, deepest in the star, the process basically produces mostly iron. So that that was the consistent picture that came out of that earlier study that said, look, we're seeing these things that are pure iron. But it turns out they're not produced as pure iron. Accurate calculations show that there's other trace elements, titanium, chromium, zinc, and, and nickel as well. And that's what we set out to do. We set out to actually detect those other species in addition to the iron. Because once you have more than one element detected, or even if you have two elements detected, that then gives you the ability to study the nuclear processes that are going on. And we were able to show that the temperature and the densities of the material were consistent with this neutrino convection process. So it was basically using the relative number of chromium, titanium, and iron atoms as the evidence to compare to the predictions of what 
temperature of material, what density of material would produce in those ratios, the, the ratios of those elements. And so the, the, the reason why this was um, something we could, we could publish in Nature was because uh, the pieces all held together. We have uh, several different types of ways of predicting the ratios of these different elements, the nucleosynthesis, um, and they all sort of pointed to one direction, which is that high, um, that high temperature, low density, um, which is uh, regions, which you get from um, this neutrino convection process. And finally, um, what further studies would you like to, to see being done? And would you like to carry it yourself, looking at CASA and other supernova remnants? Well, well, we would love to be able to do this on other supernova remnants, uh, for sure. Uh, but CASA, as I said, is, is the brightest, is one of the brightest supernova remnants in the sky. You mentioned the Crab Nebula, it's even brighter, but it doesn't have that interesting uh, composition like CASA does. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we are looking forward to the next generation of X-ray telescopes that will have much better resolution uh, in energy. Well, Chandra had really great resolution in position. It could resolve one star from another or one part of the supernova from another. Um, but the ability to distinguish, say, the, in, the um, emission from silicon from uh, calcium or titanium from uh, chromium, it was not, uh, is not as good. So we want to move to the next stage where we're able to look not only at titanium, but the other elements as well. We'd like to be able to see zinc, uh, and we'd also like to be able to have better data so that we can apply um, better modeling techniques to it. Modeling of the x-ray data is a part that comes along with our work, uh, but with better, the next generation of x-ray satellites, uh, we're, we're going to be able to model that data much, much better. Uh, and with better sensitivity, we may be able to detect some of the other fainter trace elements. Um, and we're also thinking that this neutrino convection process might actually cause changes to some of the lower, the lower atomic number elements, uh, perhaps in the area of, uh, of the potassium and the sodium. Uh, there is some evidence that those element ratios may be changed too. So uh, in order to analyze and produce data on those, we need to have the next generation of X-ray telescopes, which much better uh, re resolution in the energy of the photons, separating one energy from another. Great. And of course, um, I'm sorry, one more thing. Go ahead, go ahead uh, please. The theorists, uh, the theoretical studies are absolutely critical to this. We are at the stage now where we don't have the, the computing power to be able to call, uh, model the explosions of these stars, mm -hmm. as well as calculate the neutrino interactions and also calculate the nucleosynthesis, what elements are coming out. So we actually have to separate those parts into different pieces uh, and link them together uh, in, a, in a physically plausible way. So every increase in computing power, um, bigger and bigger supercomputers, it's gonna help us to see better into the engine. And as we see the engine better, our better measurements will hopefully allow us to confirm uh, more tightly this picture. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, future research in this area. It'll be, it's gonna be exciting. Yeah, there's so much data out there. There's, there's a lot of crunching to be done. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Jack. It was great talking with you. Well, I, I appreciate the invitation, James. It was a great, I think your, uh, your, uh, your site is great and I think your videos are wonderful and I'm happy to be able to contribute. Thank you. And that was Dr. Jack Hughes, astrophysicist at Rutgers University. Make sure to join us uh, on a, next week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, when we're going to take an inside look at the most advanced telescope ever to launch into space, the James Webb Space Telescope. We'll welcome Scott Lambros, Instrument Systems Manager for this remarkable instrument, back to the show. Make sure to join us then. 
And don't forget to join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Now, subscribers to our VIP newsletter uh, see every episode of this show a day before the general public. We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. Hmm.